Now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Now. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Reed Louise, and thank you all for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com, where you can find out about all the products and services I offer, including medical intuition evaluations, energy medicine sessions, and psychic readings. So check it out. Give me a call. Schedule a session. It's always good. And it's also brought to you by the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's www.AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. And do check out the Just Energy Radio webpage, sign up for our newsletter, or check out our archives on YouTube, Just Energy Radio on YouTube. So in this hour, we're going to be speaking with Barry Brailsford, and our topic is In Search of the Southern Serpent. So let me tell you a little bit about Barry and bring him on the air. Barry Brailsford, New Zealand graduate, MA in history uh, from Canterbury University, was a member of the New Zealand Archaeology Association Council and a principal lecturer at the Christchurch College of Education. In 1990, he was awarded a MBE for his contribution to education and Maori scholarship. Since 1990, he has been writing full-time. His work is a journey through the wisdom traditions of indigenous Pacific peoples. So, uh, the author of In Search of the Southern Serpent, plus a ton of other books, uh, please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Barry Brails- Brailsford. Hey, Barry, how are you? I'm great. So, kia ora, Rita. That's our greeting from New Zealand. Well, right back at you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. how are you, how, how is it down under? Because it's only <laughs> afternoon there for you right now. Yes, and it's, uh, it's, we're well into spring. Hey, and we're just getting into fall. So uh, the, we're like equal now. You know, it's not like I, I interviewed a friend of mine that's in Australia and, um, you know, they were like right in the middle of winter and we were having over a hundred degree temperature days and that was a little strange. Yeah, it's been off the planet really, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. All these extremes. Yeah. But they're part of the journey at the moment. Yes, it is. And, and so. That- Mm. No, go ahead. It's a, and it's something we have to adapt to, you know. But anyway, yeah. Well, um, let's go for it. Well, okay. Um, so one of the things I like to do is just to get a little background information of guests that I have come on, especially if it's their first time coming on the show, because I figure, you know, if you've been on the show before, then if people want to know who you are, they can go listen to the archive, which is always good for me. Um, yep. And so how did you become in- involved in recording indigenous uh, Maori law? Well, it began with the research within the College of Education when I wanted to take my history graduates who'd be teaching our high schools and I wanted to take them out into the world. I wanted them to realize that they had their degrees in history, but... History wasn't something that simply happened in the library. It was something that was alive and happened out in the land, and it was about people moving through life in a in a different time. So it was to do that that I started a whole program that you might call History with Boots On. And, and that led me, um, after a wee adventure with one of our Maori elders, into a whole journey of discovery. And... Uh, as they say in the Māori world, uh, Māori, of course, are our Polynesian people here. As they say in the Māori world, sometimes one of the elders fires a dart in your heart. And uh, that's what happened to me. I was in a very remote part of New Zealand doing my work and, uh, and visiting one of the high schools. And in the hotel that night... Um, this old Māori kaumātua, he fired a dart in my heart. He said, now, Mr. Professor, in fact, to use a descriptive word, he said, now, Mr. Bloody Professor, 
<laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing for our Maori children? And uh, I was kind of shocked by this, uh, yeah, very, very piercing challenge because we'd spent an hour and a half together having a great time over a jug of beer, and suddenly he, he launched into me with this now Mr. Bloody Professor, and it was such a commanding uh, challenge that uh, all the people in the hotel went very quiet. It was 100% Māori in that hotel that night, and I was the only person who we call Pākehā, the only European person of New Zealand descent. And uh, and anyway, uh, yeah, I, I just didn't know what to do, and... And a, a young Māori man came and stood beside me because the old fellow seemed to have disappeared. And he said, don't be worried and don't go. He's paid you a huge compliment. And uh, and I waited and he returned a short time later with a glass of beer for each of us and he sat down and he wept. And that, that was incredible. And I said, why are you weeping? He said, well, I weep for my grandchildren and your grandchildren are weak for their future. And what are you doing about it? And, and that was amazing. It just set me right back on my heels. So that was the beginning of a journey with the Māori people into their ancient wisdom. And out of that came two books. I, I harnessed my students, these history graduates had already got their degrees into into exploring this Māori world in terms of the archaeology and the history. And we went to numerous sites throughout the South Island of New Zealand where you could see where they'd left the mark on the land, where they'd dug into the land to create platforms for their houses, where they'd built protective walls in order to create what we call their fortifications, their pa, and, and where they'd built their wonderful gardens. And... And that journey lasted for a number of years, and out of there I, we started to, to go deeper and deeper into the past, into their culture, and gather their stories together. And out of that came a very big book called The Tattooed Land. Tattooing meaning, of course, the, the mark left on a person's face or body, but this was about the land being tattooed to leave the marks of the past. So that was the beginning, and uh, it was followed by another book about ancient Māori trails throughout the land. And then elders from one of the oldest tribes came to me one day and said, we want you to tell our story, the story of long ago that goes beyond the written history that's out there today. And, and that took me into very stormy waters, because... That story, their stories of the people who were here by their genealogies some 1,200 years before the established history, that was a turning point. That was a watershed for how we view our past. And that they'd set me free on this vessel with all this amazing information based on over 3,000 charts that some of which lasted for two days, that were the record of their past. And I was really privileged to be taken into that world of this ancient storehouse of knowledge and to be able to bring it out to the world for the first time. Okay, so I'm going to say something really politically incorrect, but why do you think they had this white, guy of European descent be the person to carry that information forward um, into this current time and actually make it become public and available? It's a question that uh, I've been asked many times and uh, for a time, for for maybe a year when I got into this work uh, I, I really wanted to give up um, there were times when they asked me to do things that that were a huge challenge. For instance, they asked me initially to lead a party right across the South Island, which was a nine-day journey walking through this ancient trail 
to actually carry some sacred stone so they could actually open the way to the old knowledge. It was a very different kind of way of life for me at this time. A whole other world view was being placed before me. And uh, and they started to teach me the protocols for for making this journey and lifting what they call a tapu. Uh, or for some people it would call tapu. That had been placed on this ancient trail because uh, 150 years ago, the European miners walked that trail of peace and the trail of the sacred stone. They walked it and in a way that was filled with anger and bloodshed and murder was committed there. So they closed it down and no one walked it for 150 years. And they said, we can't share this old knowledge until you've opened it up, until you've taken a party of 12 across that trail and lifted the tapu at seven sacred rocks. And this was a huge thing to ask of me. I was a mountain man. I mean, I was fit for that kind of thing. I I knew that the way of things across that path, but I didn't know the protocols. I, I challenged them and said, I know that in the old times, to walk that journey as the trail guide, the payarahi, you have to be taken on the learning from birth. You have to be chosen by the stars. You have to be born at a certain time of the moon. And you're asking me to do it, and I'm telling you it's too much. I'll break the protocols. I'll break the laws of old, and it'll be a disaster. And they stepped back and smiled and said, there is only one thing you need to do in this journey, only one law you need to follow, and it's the war of love. Do everything with love, and you can't make a mistake. This is a journey of the heart, as all the journeys will be with this knowledge. It is the journey of the soul and the heart. And I said, well, I can do that. (laughs) <laughs> but understand, I will make mistakes. And they said, no, there are no mistakes. It's just that everything is of a circle. If you get things wrong, then the circle will turn. And that little kink you put in the circle will be mended. And what you thought of as a mistake is merely part of your learning. And I thought, Okay, I'm up for that. So that's how it came about, and that's how it all began, this journey into the old law on the land, walking the land, following the footsteps of the old ones of 2,000 years ago. But that sounds so cool, you know, and I, I've i had people say to me, and I can see very easily how they can say this to you, you know, is that, you get it, your soul gets it, and maybe that's why they feel comfortable in in trusting you, you know, with that information, because they they realize that you have a respect and reverence for it, that maybe they're having a hard time finding in their own people. I believe there were people in their own people who could make that journey. I I know that there had to be. I, I, I remember when they first took me up into the very far north of the North Island to to a, a huge meeting of many tribes who who came to actually uh, approve the journey and and after after four or five days of of discussion a meeting of 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 over uh, one hundred and forty three of the tribes who still carried the old things um, yeah th- that was why I was there but But on the second day of that meeting, I was walking across the meeting house and one of the elders came up and he simply put his arms around me and he held me and he just said, the Waidrua, the Waidrua is there. And the Waidrua is is a kind of aura that they see around people and, uh, and, and it means the spirit. The spirit is there, the soul is there. The heart is there for this journey. I'd never met him before, and and when he said that, that was a great help for me. Uh, you know that 
that he recognized something in me that would help me to make this very challenging journey. But there's a whole other dimension to it for their own people. You see, I talk about 143 tribes gathering to give the okay for all of this knowledge to come out. And and there there is a thing about knowledge that can create envy and jealousies and huge conflicts. And these people, they were of ancient lines of long ago. And there's been a lot of change and a lot of fragmentation of of the tribes and their knowledge and a lot of loss of knowledge that was only held safe by certain within the tribes. So they were people with ambition and in the end I came to the conclusion that to ask one of their own to carry this, to undertake this journey, would have what I call too many fish hooks in it, mm-hmm. that it would be Full of, so, full of so much danger, so much possibility of challenge and envy and hate that uh, it could really, well, send it right out of control. Could, um, could sink the walker, as we call it, sink the vessel, sink the ship, that it would go nowhere. And, uh, and, and that's what I suppose the elders were saying to me in the end. They were saying, you bring a whole other discipline to this journey. You have a Western leg to stand on. You have a degree in history. You are very experienced now in archaeology. And that means that when you're challenged by our Maori people, and there will be challenges, you have that Western side to hold you balanced. But then when you're challenged by your archaeological colleagues and your history colleagues, uh, because they won't like what you're going to be doing, then you can step into the Māori side that we are to share with you, this ancient law, these amazing chants that carry so much, and you'll have that side. So, in a way, it was a kind of wisdom Mm -hmm. in the choosing. And I don't know that it was just me in particular. It was of a time and place. And uh, and maybe there were others who could fill that role. But certainly uh, I understand why they chose someone with a Western background. I mean, my people came here in 1852, so we've been around in this land for quite a long time. But, yeah, they could have chosen others, I'm sure, but... It was a journey that I made. What's interesting is it sounds like the the way that you're talking about them is that the, the Maori culture is still there and alive and thriving. You know, I think in the United States we have the Native American population, but they are so isolated and they're not part of the culture. You know, they're... It, it just sounds very different. It sounds like, you know, where you are, it, they really are part of the culture, or at least they're part of your world and your view of the culture. Would that be a, a true statement, or how does that all fit in together? Yeah, that's that's very perceptive of you. Yes, um, it, Rita, it's, it's very much like you're describing. I think our future is so centered now on a partnership. The interesting thing about colonization was that when the colonizers came here from England, when the Union Jack, as we call it, that flag of, of the United Kingdom was, was raised in this land, they, they came amidst the people who were very dynamic and, and had a huge knowledge of this land and a very very complete history of incredible voyaging. They had an, a voyaging culture, bar none. I mean, they they were utterly amazing how they they ultimately went f- 
from Hawaii out to California. We can, we can prove that archaeologically. They reach Central America. We have archaeological proof of that. And they reach Chile. And again, we have now have archaeological proof, proof of that. That, that, that they, they reached out so far and, uh, covered amazing distances in their sailing. They were the best they were over thousands of years. So they, they had an incredible sense of who they were and, and a culture founded in the land itself and the huge strength that they found in each other. So th- th- they weren't a pushover. And, uh, and, and the, although we finished up having land wars, that was because they stood so firm. They weren't going to be allow the lands to be simply wrenched away from them to be settled by white folk who came out from Great Britain. So you see, the British, in order to establish themselves here, had to make a treaty in 1840. And, uh, and, and that treaty is one of the most inspired and enlightened treaties you'll find anywhere on the planet because it created a partnership and there were huge guarantees made to the Maori people that they would have control of so much in their future. Now, it doesn't mean that that wasn't attacked in later times when the Europeans created a parliament and ultimately brought in the in the regiments to try and and push themselves forward. But they, again, they were met uh, with huge resistance and and had eventually to acknowledge the the power that was there and uh, and 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 work within that partnership that had been set in place in 1840. And that partnership, that document of agreement that we call the Waitangi Treaty Settlement, uh, that, that is now written into legislation that goes through Parliament, it runs through all the government administrations, it runs through our education system, it runs through our democracy uh, throughout the land, and, and it, it, it demands that there is space for all, there is a voice for all. And it doesn't mean it hasn't got wrinkles, but it's a wonderful base from which to work. And we are creating a culture here. Uh, it's It's got a European base, it's got a Maori base, it's becoming a beautiful blend of the two, and I believe that's our future. And we have a huge amount of inter, of intermarriage, uh, within this society. And, and children of, these beautiful children of mixed race, and this goes back to the 1830s and beyond, these are, these are children who carry dynamic qualities and, uh, and lots of wonderful things forward. So, we're very lucky, you know, we've, we're of a scale, too, with only a population of four million, where we can speak face-to-face and try and work things through. But it, it's just so wonderful to hear that the, their culture wasn't suppressed, you know, and their culture wasn't um, put down and, and, and them trying to, like, wipe it out. Yeah, well, there were phases when there were some who were dedicated to that, some European politicians who who were saying what was said in North America, you know, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, and the only good Maori is a dead Maori. Uh, But that that never got traction. There were too many who who were prepared to 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 open the way to honoring the partnership and and uh, the the thing is that Māori did take a huge uh, loss of life and and that came from the fact that they were so isolated here for so many generations that they fell prey to things like chicken pox and measles they had no resistance to those and certainly um, you know the white death uh, 
TB was a terrible scourge here. So the population took a huge hit just simply from disease. But there has been a huge energy amongst Māori themselves uh, to become doctors and nurses. And I have to say that in the last 40 years, the biggest, most dynamic thing that's happened in this land has been what we call the Māori Renaissance. And the culture is a burgeoning culture. And, uh, yeah, it, it stands tall. And out of where they're standing and out of the foundation of, of Western civilization that was brought here, we're making a new culture. But that's, it's just wonderful to hear. I mean, I have become, you know, a student of myth and you read a lot of the material, the little bit that there is left, um, you know, and, and the, the condescending way that many of these Europeans would refer to and interact with indigenous cultures and the missionaries and the blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just, it's heart wrenching to me to, to just, you know, interact with that. But let, let, let's move on because we don't, we have finite time and I have a bunch of questions that we haven't, we haven't even started on. Um, I know. Go for but it. I just like listening to you talk. I love your voice. I'm sorry. You can just talk to me like all day long. Um, how old, you know, let's just talk about, uh, the culture on New Zealand, you know, and, and the Maori culture. How far back does that go in time? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, um, this is a matter of huge controversy and I have to admit that, that I'm the maverick in the scene in that, uh, at the moment, there is a mainstream view that it only goes back 800 years. But, of course, everything that I've been taught takes us back 2,000 years. It's another 1,200 years on top of that. And the old ones who've been teaching me, who are bringing out this wonderful information from over 3,000 chants, as I said earlier, some of which last for two days, these are their histories. These are their sacred law. And they're telling me that they came here at least 86 generations ago. And when they arrived, there were already people here. And these people were people of, again, a Polynesian uh, culture. So, you know, we, we, we've got this controversy going on. We've got those who are holding to the old, old view that, no, no, that weren't people here 800 years ago. And, and, and beyond that, and then we've got uh, all that's opening up. And the lovely thing about the opening up, taking us back 2,000 years and more, is that this is coming through other scientists who are using quite modern and marvellous techniques to open up doors that say, we think there were people here at least 3,000 years ago and maybe more. So it's a much deeper story than the 800-year one. And, uh, you know, I've had the privilege of, of putting that story there back 2,000 years and open the possibilities of much more. And it, it takes a long time to, to change the mainstream view. And, I mean, that was so in America. I mean, the, the Clovis culture that was said to be the founding culture of North American culture only went back eleven and a half thousand years, but but now it's opened up to thirty thousand because when they went and redug those sites that go back eleven and a half thousand years, they found that a couple of meters beneath it, several yards beneath, there was a whole other culture. So things get ingrained and it's very hard to challenge them. So it's a challenging time, but exciting oh i think it's very exciting especially because our our western world view and i'm being very specific with that our western world view is starting to change and it, in my opinion and i would like to hear your thought is starting to be more reflective um you know in alternative thought communities of indigenous wisdom yeah, and and I think that's 
that's wonderful for the future of the planet. You see, we've, uh, yeah, for for many centuries now, we've we've actually decided that we have the right to rape the planet, and and I use that word to exploit and without regard for the future, um, you know, and and that process began a long time ago. It, it began, yeah, fifteen hundred years ago, and maybe more. Uh, because we had this wonderful event, the rise of Christianity, uh, the, the the rise of that wonderful spirit, the Christ spirit of love and and healing. But of course, it all became kind of systematized, uh, uh, became an ism, and then we created a hierarchy where there was a church, and and uh, within that church, the uh, the organizing voice was the male voice, and uh, and Mary eventually got her place as someone who give a- access to the hereafter. But of course, what the church did was ultimately take a very narrow view of God. I mean, the the indigenous peoples, the as they were called, the pagan peoples of the planet, they saw the magic of creation and everything. They saw spirit and everything. They saw spirit and stone and the rainbow and and the rivers and the waters. They saw spirit and the trees and the life of the trees. They saw spirit and everything around them and the flight of the birds and their song. So their view of creation was embraced embraced everything. And, and they honored those things. So you couldn't go in this land in the Polynesian times. You couldn't simply go and cut down a tree. You needed it, but you just didn't go and cut it down. You had to ask for the cutting. And you had to do it in a, in a way that honored the tree and, and, and honored the forest around the tree and, and took a branch and used it like the blade of a stone axe to, to brush across the tree and say, you are going to fall. And I'm telling the whole forest, there will be a death here. But when you fall, your timbers will be used to help our people. And you'll be used for houses and keep us warm. You'll be used for fires to keep us warm through the winter times and the cold. You'll be used for vessels to help us fish. You'll be used for vessels that allowed us allow us to cross the oceans to different places. So there was an honoring that. There was honoring in everything. When you caught the first fish you had to let it go. You gave it back to the ocean. You said, I honor you. So they honored the spirit of everything. They didn't just take and take regardless. And the, and the, their whole systems when they made change they had to honor the fact that they had to look forward seven generations to see what that would mean. It was a, it was a, a wide view of life. And they honored the stars and, and the turning of the stars and used them for navigation. Uh, there was an honoring in so much. But when we took spirit out of everything, when all spirit was centered on God, the one God who was supreme and everything, then God was taken out of all these things. The <laughs> spirit of life and energy, all this magic that is around us, went into a church, went into a space, into into something that uh, divorced people from the land itself, the spirit of the land, and brought in this allowance allowed people to ravage the land and use and abuse to their own advantage. And those who followed these, what we call the pagan ways, who honored spirit and things, I mean, ultimately, as we know, there were, there were literally hundreds of thousands were burnt at the stake, women in particular, for honoring the power of healing of the plants and 
and the signs they read in the land around them and honoring the spirit that they did in such a powerful way. So, you know, the indigenous peoples have a wisdom that goes deep into the land and helps us once again to find a sustainability, to live in partnership with everything around us, to allow space for spirit to move and things to grow and serve. You know, and that's yeah. just a whole different mental philosophy than we see in today's, you know, and I just like to say Western culture. Although you hear a number of very similar and parallel concepts that come out of like Native American culture. So this is my next question. It's anyway, um, I believe that, um, our ancestors, you know, one that there is a core piece of information that seems to be unified around the world, you know, kind of going in line with some of what you were talking about. You know, I feel it's just one little piece of it, Um, you know, but that they had a much better grasp on the physical world as well as the, and I'm going to say the etheric world, the unseen world, Um in your study of the Maori, what conclusions have you reached regarding their understanding of what we're just rediscovering in physics and quantum physics? Well, I think I think their understanding of of, um, of of the way of things is truly startling. And you know, just to pick up on the first point. I believe that there are universal truths that I'll find in throughout the Pacific and I spend a lot of time with North American people, the Native American people. Um, I find the same truths. I, 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 they are part of what works in life. They're part of, of being, yeah, being wrapped up in everything around you, understanding, I mean, they ha- they understand the kinship of all, that it's all connected, it's related, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a spider or or a horse you're riding across the Great Plains, um, there's a kinship of all life, and, uh, and for me and for people here, it, it extends to the trees and the fish and the birds and everything, so... There's this, these things that I call universal truths that go beyond culture and race that are foundation wisdom that was understood in what I'll perhaps call pagan times. You find it in China, you find it in India, you find it in Africa, you know, I found it all around the planet. So, so there's, there's as, that aspect of things. I, I think that's important to understand that that there is a found, there are foundation truths that we can go back to. And I believe what the indigenous peoples have done is that through great sacrifice at times, um, they, they've managed to hold on to the sacred, if you will, uh, so that the sacred is, is still attainable today. We can still bring it into our time, you know, this wisdom of the sacred. But, but you talk about quantum physics. I mean, I've become totally wrapped up in quantum physics and string theory and all the rest of it. Because when I go back into the cosmologies of Polynesia, I find remarkable things. You know, when I, when I go into the chant for the creation story, it's incredible because they say in the beginning was the nothingness, the great void. And into the nothingness came the great sound. And out of the great sound came life and all that is. And they move on from that and they say, and the great suns were born, the great fires of the heaven. And the planets came, you know, that there was the firmament. The um, They talk about the time when on the the earth here, that the earth and the sky were one. There was no sun. Now, when you go back into the whole physics of things, the astrophysics, of course, there were so many 
gases in the atmosphere, as our planet cooled, the sun couldn't get through. So the earth and sky were one. And then they go on from that, you know, and they say, stone is the first ancestor of all life. And when we go into the the biology of things and the creation of life, we go back to the primal soup, but we go back to stone, we go back to the crust of the earth, which held within it the building blocks of life. You know, and it's all there, it's all in the charts, and I'm saying, wow, how did they understand this? How did they come to such amazing, visionary, perceptive conclusions about the sequence of things? Incredible. So do, where do you think they maybe came up with this information? I mean, that's something that I battle with. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk of pre-existing cultures, you know. I mean, we just had um, Jack Churchwood on in the, in the previous hour talking about the lost continent of Mu, you know, and about the advanced uh, culture that was on that continent. I mean, do you think there was a pre-existing culture that had access, you know, and, and the science knowledge to create this base, and we just, you know, in our cosmologies today, have a remnant of it? There are times when I I really think that, you know, I, 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 I wonder very deeply about exactly what you're saying. Um, I have been given a story that I haven't written, um, it's Ooh, a, story. It's a secret story? Not really. It's something oh, that... man, I like secret stories. Well, it is a it is pretty secret story. Okay, good, 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 good. The thing about the stories is that they always have a number of levels. And if you read it at one level, and that's how it was given to me first off, it's just a simple story to tell the grandchildren around the fire at night, you know. But if you are then introduced through the elders to the deeper levels, suddenly you see that it's actually telling you about some kind of vehicle coming from the stars. And the great they call it the great flaming walker, a walker being a, 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 a ship. But this is a ship from the stars. And, and, and when they came... Uh, they stayed, and and there were five brothers, and each of them had particular wonderful things to offer the people. And they go into each of these, um, which are the foundations of the knowledge, the music, and uh, the understanding of the stars, and all kinds of yeah foundation knowledge upon which a culture could be built. And then they describe after all of this knowledge has been passed on, how this fiery walker takes to the skies. And rather tragically, it destructs. That something goes wrong, and uh, and it crashes into the ocean. And, uh, and, and it's the end of that story, but something really powerful was left behind. So... You know, I hear that story, and uh, you get it at several levels, and and that's the final level they were taking me to on it, and and it and uh, it's just like a wee fairy story when you hear it first off, but when you're taking deeper and deeper into it, you begin to say, well, this sounds like a spacecraft, and this sounds like some beings who something have something amazing to offer to establish the basis of of many cultures well and that's that's one of my soapboxes these days is that story is repeated over and over and over and over i mean the details are different but all around the world mm, yeah yeah the the maori say they come from the pleiades Oh, yeah, really? They, the Polynesians say we come from the Pleiades, and and the new year here starts when certain stars align, which is le- usually around about late March into no, June. 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 Yeah, around about June they come to the Māori New Year, 
and uh, there are several ways in which it's done. You know, I've written of how the Waitaha, these early people who I wrote so much about, who were here from 2,000 years ago, and and they had their their wise star man, their stargazer, on a particular hill in the South Island, or it's quite high, and uh, and and he was there in June with his apprentice, and and they had to sleep out for many nights until they they saw a sunrise, and at the same time there was a morning star, they called it, there at the same time as the sun rising, and it was still evident in the sky until the light from the sun obliterated it, you know, and the star was no longer seen. But it was very precise. The star had to be able to be seen as the sun rose for 15 heartbeats. And when it did, that was the beginning of the new year. And then that word was sent out from there in in various ways, and I won't go into that, but uh, it was sent out throughout the land. We now have the beginning of the new year. So it's, it's not an absolute set day, it's all set by the stars, by, by that uh, coincidence of the, the sun rising and the stars still appearing and, and being there in view for 15 heartbeats. But then there are other ways in which that takes place, but they, they all come together, but different parts of the land, there's different ways of saying this is the new year, but it's all decided by the stars. In fact, so much in life was bound by the stars. Yeah. But that's really cool. Um, I'm looking at the clock, and there's one question that I have that is just a personal question, um, yeah. but it's and you kind of a little mentioned this earlier, um, but it's about the tr- tradition of tattooing. And I find it curious that, you know, in the Maori culture, tattooing is just such a really important aspect of the culture, but it's not something that you find in vast other places. So, you know, to me, it, it's pretty well localized in that culture. Um why is it so important or is there significance in the patterns or the ritual of tattooing that makes it so compelling for them? Well, there, there, are, there are two answers to this for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I see we've got about ten minutes and, uh, and I'll, I'll just take a wee bit of time over it for you. Uh, you're quite right. Tattooing is really important in this culture throughout Polynesia. And uh, the tattooing is very particular to that person. It's not something you say, I like this decoration, please put it on me. It's, um, it, it's, it's, it's wholly decided uh, by the family, by uh, all kinds of things that are part of your history, going back through time. It's decided by who your tribe is. And, 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 and their relationship with the world around them. Uh, it's decided by your mana, that is, your spiritual essence. All kinds of things come into it, and, and it's a very special thing to, to go that path, to actually decide to bring all of those things into visible form. So, yeah, it has a powerful place, and, and it means a lot, and it's coming back, uh, very, very much in this huge time of Māori Renaissance. It's, uh, it's a way of, uh, you know, for, for people to stand tall in the truth of who they are. But there's a whole other dimension to it. Um, you see, in the, in the deserts, uh, I think it's called, I'm sure it's called the Gobai Desert, uh, that borders China, uh, They've discovered, the Chinese discovered some 20 years ago, uh, some amazing burials that had uh, taken place in the desert in a very, very dry climate. And, and the, the 18 or 20-odd uh, 
mummies they found there, uh, their clothing was still intact, and their they were totally mummified, and uh, most of them were tattooed. And uh, I've seen pictures of these tattoos. It's very interesting. The Chinese have done amazing things in terms of that particular archaeology. So tattooing it was there, and and actually the the interesting thing about those people, they they were wearing a particular kind of uh, clothing that we we'd call the the pattern of the uh, Celtic uh, and Scottish. Uh, uh, well, it's their tartans, we call them today. And, and what they discovered were, now this is 4,000 years ago, they discovered that, um, that these, these actual fibers were not of the sheep that you find around that area. They go back to the sheep of the extreme Western Europe, right across in France and into the UK and into Scotland. So those people were tattooed. And uh, th- there are other parts of the world too where people have been tattooed. So it's, um, it- it's part of a number of cultures, but it's something that was lost in other cultures but has continued as an important thing in Polynesia. Well, but in Polynesia, you know, we have the facial tattooing that, you know, I don't know if they did that in other cultures, um, you know, but it just seems like there are these designs and patterns that seem very consistent versus, you know, having a smiley face tattooed on you. And, you know, I don't know what the uh, mummies, what kind of tattooing they had on themselves, you know, but then there's... You know, I, I want to say Ozzy or whatever his name was, the uh, the Ice Man that they found, and he had some tattooing on him yeah. as well. Um, yeah. You know, although they seem to think that uh, the tattooing actually was having to do with going along acupuncture points, which is kind of interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think I think today when tattoos are done in prisons by inmates and tattoos are, you know, the smiley faces, you should call them, or the the tattoo of, uh, well, defiance, um, you know, they're of a whole other thing. I, I believe the tattoos in the indigenous peoples and the ancient cultures had amazing meaning, and, and, and they, they were very special, precious things in life. So... Marking yourself in that way, and, and Māori used a lot of facial tattoos, but throughout the Pacific they were done on the thighs and round the back and, and, and were, were, were amazing patterns that told an incredible story. And, and I think tattooing is part of that, part of a wonderful story about the people themselves, uh, particular tribes, and about the individuals within that tribe. So it was a, a thing of great honour to carry the tattoo. So I think you're onto something here. You know, I, I, I truly um, believe that you know, tattooing had an ancient history and and a powerful one. Mm-hmm. Barry, I am looking at the clock, and we are just about out of time. And you're delightful, and I still could, like, listen to you for hours. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, you know, so the book that I have here is In Search of the Southern Serpent. So is this available, like, on Amazon or in the U.S.? Uh, it's not available. Well, yeah, wait on. I'm just going to ask Krishla <laughs> here. <laughs> A quick answer. It's not available in the U.S. It has to be ordered either from our website or, because it's co-written, there is a website in England um, by the other author, so people could order it from there. In fact, it's probably cheaper, to be honest, to do that. Yeah, but Barry can't sign it if it comes from the other guy. True, and the other guy can't sign it either, unfortunately, because he's he's not with us anymore. Oh, well, that <laughs> would be hard. But um, most 
But is, but your other books that you were talking about are those also available on your website because you were talking about them? I'm like, wait, I should have got copies of those too. But anyway, yeah, yeah there's a lot of books available. See, I, I've written uh, 14 books over the last 20 years that are all available, and uh, and and they all deal with the ancient law, and uh, and they come in different forms. Some of them uh, are, are quite. Uh, yeah, based on, on, on science, uh, on archaeology and history. Uh, they're always written as a bridge across into the general public. So they're, they're not written for, our, for my colleagues. They're written for the general public. But I've, I've got quite a few books there as e-books as well. And, uh, and my last two novels that have come out, one which goes into quantum theory and, uh, and whatever, and its relation to, th- to things we've talked about is called um, Just the Hut in the Mountains. Only a hut in the mountains, not just. Only a hut in the mountains. <laughs> and the other one is called Where the Octopus Waits. Where the Octopus Waits. And the first one goes into a lot of the old law, uh, which is you know, really important for individuals to be able to find their links to the past and the ancient families that have gifted on special things in our DNA. And the, the one about uh, where the octopus waits is about voyaging and the, the ancient craft of voyaging. But both of those are novels, and that's one of the ways I would love to bring out the ancient law by using novels, historical novels, so to speak, that do it through story. Join host well, I, I was told that we have 45 seconds left and the music's playing, which means I'm going to get talked to over. So, Barry, we need to go. Well, it's been lovely anyway to spare this, uh, to spend this Well, we're going to have to have you back on because you just are jam-packed with information. Energy. Okay? Going host Dr. Got to go Reed on that any time. time. Okay. Thank you so radio. much for coming on. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com to you, too. And that, that's Barry Brailsford, his book that we talked about is In Search of the Southern Serpent. And next week we're going to be speaking with Lou Graham about the hidden history of your future. And so until next week, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com for more show information and to contact Dr. Rita. Until next time, remember, it's all just energy.